Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I will be starting today's webinar by going over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, I would like to ask everyone to please uh, mute your computers. And if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat section. At the end of each presentation, we will have a few minutes to uh, go over those questions. Uh, also, I wanna uh, mention that we will be recording this webinar and uh, we'll be posting the webinar and the presentations on our website. And with that, I turn it over to our chair, Bernadette. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining today. And uh, I get the privilege of introducing our first speaker, Bashko Shandan. Uh, his topic, Reducing NOx and CL Emissions from Petroleum Refineries and Related Operations in South Coast Air Basin. Um, he had a few other co-authors that are listed on the talk. And he's a Senior Air Quality Engineering Manager. He manages the refinery permitting and back teams in South Coast um, Engineering and Permitting Office. And he oversees the permitting of the refineries, hydrogen plants, bulk loading terminals, and the development of new backlistings. He has over 30 years of experience in air quality and air pollution control, and he is the past chair of AWMA. Thank you, Bashkar, and welcome. Thanks. Uh, Benedict, were you going to uh, introduce the ACE and say something about ACE or you or Sarah? I think I was going to do that at the end, just because there's still people joining, so it would probably be good to do it at the end. Um, but these are all um, presentations that were done at um, the ACE conference in San Francisco last month. But at the end, I'll go over, um, there, there were a number of um, items um, about the ACE conference and, um, you know, different awards and stuff. So let me do that at the end after the presentation. Okay. Sure. Simon, can you give me the controls? Okay, got it. You see my presentation? Good afternoon and welcome to this Encore webinar. These are the three presentations that were at the ACE, uh, which concluded uh, recently. It was June 30th was what my presentation was uh, in one of the sessions on the last day of the conference. So topics of discussion, basically I'm going to go through 1109.1, um, .1. this is primarily the uh, focused on Rule 1109.1, .1, the background applicability. And along with Rule 1109.1, .1, we adopted a couple of more rules to, in support of 1109.1. .1. So I'm to, going to go through those uh, rules also. Uh, next slide. This gives you a good synopsis of what South Coast AQM is. I think most of the people on this call are familiar with this. So I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, so why did we need um, to develop this rule? Basically, South Coast Air Basin is still in non-attainment with ozone. We are extreme ozone non-attainment. And we are in non-attainment PM 2.5 standards. So rule 1109.1, NOx reductions are key uh, in attaining the ozone standards. And this 1109.1 uh, rule is a big step for us to get us into attainment for the ozone standards. Background on 1109.1, uh, it was developed uh, primarily, it was one of the AQMP measures, the Air Quality Management Plan measures for additional five ton reduction of NOx, and also to meet AB 617 requirements for BART, which is Best Available Retrofit Control Technology. So a lot of these sources have not been subject to BART or they were subject to some other regulations. So basically this rule establishes NOx BART limits for nearly 300 pieces of combustion equipment at the refineries. And at the same time uh, included CO emissions to make sure that the NOx reductions don't result in any increase in the CO emissions. Rule 1109.1 was developed through extensive uh, public process. 
as you can see on this slide, we had 25 working group meetings, public meetings, including community meetings, and 86, 17 uh, meetings we, where we presented what we were doing. Over 100 stakeholder meetings um, with environmental organizations, VESPAs, other agencies, the facilities themselves. And we had five committee briefings uh, to Station Resource Committee, which basically comprises of our governing board members. And as you can see, pretty extensive. It took us uh, about three years from the start when we proposed the rule to the uh, when we finally adopted the rule in November of 2021. The rule applies to the nine petroleum refineries in South Coast Air Basin three smaller refineries, the asphalt plants and the biodiesel facilities, and also related operations like hydrogen plants which supply to the petroleum refineries and also the sulfuric acid plant. So the rule applies to these, all of these facilities. Core requirements of the rule are in uh, table one and table two of the rule. Um, I'll have a summary on the next slide. Table one limits are more stringent than table two. Um, we recognize that uh, not all the units can meet the table one limits. For some of the units, it would be very expensive to meet the table one limits. And, and the target was to have a cost effectiveness of less than $50,000 per ton of NOx reduction that we get. So we developed what we call table two limits, which are less stringent. Um, certain units if they meet the conditions which i'll go through also in the next slides uh, can opt to meet table two limits instead of table one this is the comparison of table one and table two limits pretty much all the commercial sources at the refineries and the related operations are covered here whether it's boilers process heaters fccus flares gas turbines calciners smr heaters tail gas incinerators, sulfuric acid furnaces, and vapor incinerators. So as you can see, uh, table one limits are more stringent than table two. For example, for boilers greater than 110 million BTUs, the table one limit would be 5 ppm, but the table two would be 7.5. Uh, important to note, these are corrected to 3%. Most of them, except for gas turbines, would be corrected to 15%. And the limits are based on, again, most of them are a 24 hour basis, but there are long term limits. Some are uh, seven day, you know, and 365 day limits also. For example, the FCCU, there are two limits. One is a short term and one is a long term limit. And overall in meeting these, uh, the cost effectiveness um, was under the, our target of 50,000 tons per NOx reduction, per ton of NOx reduction. So which units can take table two limits? Uh, there were limitations. If the new SCR on that unit was installed after December 4, 2015, so those are newer SCRs which should be able to meet the table two limits. So they cannot, I mean, table one limits, they can meet the table one limits, so they cannot take the table two limits. Units with large potential reduction should meet table one limits also. And units that are already achieving the table one limits cannot opt for table two limits. And the units that are being scheduled for shutdown, they can also not, uh, are not allowed to take the table two limits. So in order to give flexibility to the refineries, um, there are a couple of options that we developed. Uh, instead of taking table one and table two limits, these are what we call the B plan and B cap. B plan is basically instead of taking that limits in table one or table two, let's say the boiler is a 5 ppm limit. And if you want one unit to be at 7 ppm because 5 ppm is too expensive to get to, you can up that limit, but then it has to be compensated by another unit, which let's say you take a 3 ppm limit. So in aggregate, you're still meeting the table one limits of 5 ppm, but it gives you flexibility on which unit you can select uh, a higher and a lower limit. And again, this is just to give flexibility in aggregate. Um, at the end of uh, the implementation, the refineries will be meeting all the targets that we have in table one and table two limit. 
And similarly with the B cap, which is instead of a PPM limit, it's a mass limit. Um, and if finance can opt to take that mass limit, which would be equivalent to table one and table two. Actually, if they take a B cap, they have to reduce it uh, additional 10%. Um, but each equipment will have some NOx limit. It may not be table one or table two limit, but they need to meet this B cap limit, which is mass limit, aggregate mass limit for the whole refinery. So this basically summarizes uh, B cap and B plan. As I said, 10% additional environmental benefit if you choose to take the B cap option. Implementation was also a challenge. You know, we're expecting over 90 SCR upgrades or upgrade of new SCRs and 75 low NOx burner projects on these refineries. These are complex projects, it takes a long time to implement. Uh, multi-million dollar projects and to have all of them going at the same time it's not feasible so the implementation has been spread out and I'll go in the next slide there are various options for implementation and um, this what we call an I plan provides five different options for the refineries uh, to implement the measures that are required under rule 11.9.1 so um, as you can see the options, um, the targets basically are um, the NOx reduction target and rule that they have to meet. So the percent target is, it's not the number of units, it's basically what the target is for each refinery. And that's again specified pretty well in the rule. The targets are based on uh, 2017 as a baseline. And although the implementation, you know, as you can see, there are deadlines up to 2031. What is um, required, um, basically, these 75% of the reductions are going to happen in the next five years by 2027. And 90% of the reductions are expected to be achieved by 2031. The full implementation is going to uh, we expect it to extend it to 2035, but majority of the reductions are going to happen um, in the near future. So what are the total NOx reductions that we expect once this rule is fully implemented? Uh, it's 7.7 .7 to 7.9 tons per day of NOx reduction once the rule is fully implemented. Along with this rule, uh, there were a couple of other rules that we have also adopted uh, in support of Rule 1109.1, which is Rule 429.1, which has startup and shutdown provisions, and Rule 1304 and 2005, which are narrow backed exemptions under NSR. So I'll go through those in more details in the next slides. Rule 429.1 has startup shutdown provisions um, for the equipment that will be permitted through 1109.1. Uh, there are limits on uh, startup shutdown. You know, it could be two hours for process uh, heaters, boilers, and up to 120 hours for FCCUs. So during this time, they would be exempt from uh, the limits in rule 1109.1. If any of the units have um, limits that are lower than this, like, you know, many of the gas turbines and newer uh, installations might already have startup shutdown limits. As long as they are lower than this, those units would stay in the permit. Similarly, the number of startups and shutdowns, there are limits in Rule 12429.1, as you can see on this table. So we found the need to, uh, I'll go into that a little more for a narrow exemption uh, for PM10 and SOX emissions. Under Rule 1304 is where our exemptions are, and SR rule is Rec 13. Uh, but for reclaim pollutant at reclaim sources, the SR rule is under Rule 2005. So both of those rules were amended for this exemption. As you know, refinery fuel gas has a lot of sulfur. So when it goes through combustion, that sulfur converts to SO2. SO2, when it goes over the catalyst, uh, partly converts to SO3. We have seen 
conversion of anywhere between three to eight percent depending on the catalyst manufacturers there are lower conversion catalysts available but what we have seen in practice is between three and eight percent so that conversion of so2 to so3 happens over the catalyst now you inject ammonia for scr so that ammonia ammonia slip in your stack combines with so3 to form ammonium sulfates which is pm now we are installing the scr for NOx reduction but there is an emission increase of pm and our trigger for pm back is one pound in south coast aqmd so that just the installation of scr and reducing nox would trigger pm back on the back side and pm back is basically reducing the sulfur in the refinery fuel gas to like 30 ppm is what our current back is so um for many of the refineries, this is a very expensive proposition. Reducing sulfur is not easy. It could cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And the pro purpose of Rule 1109.1 for, for NOx reduction, and what we found that around the state, there are other agencies that do exempt secondary pollutants. For example, here we have PM secondary pollutant for thermal oxidizers, you're controlling VOC, but you have NOx emission increase. So those are exempt by many districts. We didn't have these exemptions, so we've developed very narrow exemption. In consultation with EPA, California Resources Board, we talked to other agencies also. So that exemption is, again, very limited for only for the projects that are implementing, that are being done to reduce NOx to meet bulk limits and there should not be any increase in total capacity uh, we have to make sure that any increases don't exceed the state or national ambient air quality standards and uh, important to note that not this project should exceed um, the federal trigger on the msr which is 10 tons in south coast and we have checked and make sure that none of these projects would actually exceed 10 tons um, because otherwise, if you exceed 10 tons, then layer triggers on the federal side. But we don't expect any projects to exceed that. Socioeconomic impacts, uh, we expect this rule to cost $2.3 billion when it's fully implemented. The cost is around $133 million per year. We had done an extensive social impact, socioeconomic analysis and the positive impacts from this are projected annual average increase of 213 jobs, less than one cent a gallon increase in gasoline costs, uh, 2.6 billion in monetized health benefits are expected once the rule is fully implemented, 370 premature deaths avoided, uh, over 6,000 asthma attacks will be avoided and over 21,000 work loss days will be avoided over the period that this rule is expected to be implemented, which is 2023 to 2037. That pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, in conclusion, the rule development took almost three years to accomplish. It meets 8617 requirements uh, and community commitment to reduce 50% NOx emissions. Um, expecting you know, over 300 applications, we've already received around 50 applications. Um, for this rule to implement this rule and over the next two to five years we will have expect a lot more applications to come in. The plan provides flexibility to the refineries both in meeting the table one and table two limits and implementation of the rule. And we'll have substantial NOx reduction 7.7 .7 to 7.9 tons per day. Um, my co-authors, Michael Krause and Heather Farr, I thank them for helping me put this presentation. If you have any questions, I can answer, maybe take a couple of questions now, or you can contact us um, if you have any other further questions. With that, I'll conclude and hand it um, to Simon if there are any questions. Thank you, Bhaskar. Uh, I've been monitoring the chat section. I don't see any questions, but I see that um, sorry, someone raised their hand. So uh, 
You can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Bhaskar, this is uh, Bhagavan. Um, hope you're doing well. Nice presentation. Uh, quick question for you, two quick questions for you. One is just to make sure that the rule 1109.1, .1, the scope is for BART, meaning existing sources, correct? Um, it covers new sources also. If, if there are any new sources, it would they ought to meet uh, table one and table two limits. So there might be some projects which are replacement of existing unit, which would fall under this rule also. Okay. So, uh, so if it's not a replacement in kind, but if I'm bringing in a brand new source, would that be held to the table one limits? So let's say if South Coast was looking at a new boiler and will they be looking at the table one limits or can they go any more stringent than that? Oh, we can go, any new project would trigger back. If okay. it triggers back, then yeah, back limits would be applicable, which could be more stringent than the table one limits. So back okay. is determined at the time of permitting. So if those limits, if back is more stringent then those limits would apply, yes. Okay, one other follow up on the 429.1. So on the startup and shutdown provisions that you have there, so are the emissions from those duration of the time that you're in startup and shutdown, are those accounted for someplace and would offsets from them need to be provided um, at some point? Yeah, yeah, offsets would be provided for startup and shutdown, but they would be exempt from the table one, table two limits during the startup and shutdown. But when we calculate offsets, we would include those emissions in determining how right. offsets are needed. And would those be done at the rule limits of 1109.1 sorry, at, uh, at limits? So, I mean, you know, there are huge reductions from 1109.1. So as far as offsets trigger us are concerned, we wouldn't expect any project to really need offsets for NOx. PM10 offsets from any increase in SCR is exempt already from our rule because it's a secondary pollutant that's formed from insulation of SCR. Did I answer your question, Bhagwan? I believe so. I think so. I mean, I can always bring you data on the path of order. Thank you, though. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I see one more question in the chat section, uh, and then I, I think after that, we can move to the next presentation. So Ben is asking, you had discussed PM created ac across SCR units. What are your thoughts regarding PM increases associated with CO catalysts? Um, so the, across the SCR catalyst, the SO2 converts to SO3 and SO3 downstream of the catalyst combines with ammonia in presence of water to form PM. Um, I don't know of any mechanics. There could be some CO created, uh, but we, I don't believe those were taken into account. Um, when we do the calculations for PM increase, it's predominantly, it's, it's all from uh, formation of the ammonia sulfur. Thank you, Oscar. So, uh, if you could introduce Sarah, and sure. I will bring the slides uh, shortly. Okay. Thanks, Simon. So, let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, the topic is going to be blended hydrogen and natural gas fuel for power generation. Uh, Sarah Head is going to make the presentation. She's from she is principal scientist at York Engineering, where she specializes in air permitting and compliance. She has over 45 years of consulting experience and is currently working on several power generation projects involving hydrogen. She is the chair of Ventura County APCD Advisory Committee, a past president of Air and Waste Management, and currently serves as director of West Coast Section and China Line section of the air waste management. Sarah, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Bashkar. So um, my my presentation is obviously quite different from Bashkar's. You, you know, the, those of you that weren't at the beginning of this, um, these are just snapshots of presentations from the annual conference. So um, I'm gonna today talk about a case study of uh, a project that York is working on, and I'd like to thank my co-authors, Greg Wolf and Jim, Jeb Adams, who have been working with me on these projects. Um, can we have the next slide? Yeah. 
So this is just a real snapshot of York Engineering. We're a consulting firm. We like to say that we do everything that a environmental health and safety um, person at a company would need. Um, we do a lot of air permitting and also CEQA analyses. Next slide. Um, this is just a map of our York office locations. You can see we have a lot of offices, about a dozen of them, um, but they're all within California at this time being. Next slide. So my presentation is going to um, talk a little bit about the driver for hydrogen use, some of the hydrogen fuel attributes, um, and then jump into my case study of the Palomar hydrogen project. Um, next slide. So um, again, just as a little more background, um, this particular um, case study is for the San Diego Gas and Electric Palomar Energy Center, which is a 588 megawatt hydrogen project. Um, we're also doing some other, York is also doing other um, hydrogen fuel blending projects um, for other um, clients, um, a couple of which are doing the Mariposa Energy Center and Sentinel Energy Center, which we're going to be doing some um, hydrogen testing um, in the near future. So that's also an interesting uh, couple of projects we have going on. Next slide. Um, SB 100, it, it's the um, uh, re legislation that came across a couple years ago, and it's called the 100% Clean Energy Act of 2018. Um, it sets a goal of um, coming up with meeting a state's electricity needs with a zero carbon resources, meaning mostly solar and wind or other ways that don't generate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it updates the state's renewable portfolio standard and it requires the California Energy Commission California Public Utilities Commission and the California Air Resources Board to um, implement pro programs under the existing laws to achieve 100% clean energy. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, power companies are looking at ways that they can convert their um, existing power plants to, to meet these goals. Next slide. Um, so use of, of blended hydrogen fuels, and, and this I, um, most of these bullets I borrowed from a GE presentation, so I wanna give them credit for that. Um, but hydrogen requires triple the volume of flow for the same energy content. Um, the use of hydrogen decarbonizes the fuel, so it reduces greenhouse gases, VOC, CO, and SOx emissions, but because hydrogen produces higher flame temperatures, it can increase NOx emissions. So that's the big concern with use of hydrogen is the potential um, for NOx emissions. Um, and, it, and at really high levels, like 100% um, use of hydrogen, it would in, require some changes to the system. But um, most of the things that I've read show that the use of hydrogen at less than up to about 30% blend um, should be able to be easily met with the current SCR systems that are in place. Next slide. So who, who knew that hydrogen had colors? Um, so the, the, the one that was a surprise to me is gold. And, and I read something recently that people are actually trying to extract um, hydrogen from the earth um, that's already naturally occurring. But most of the time in these projects, we're talking about green hydrogen which is hydrogen that is produced with the electrolysis of water, um, but using renewable energy to produce the hydrogen so that there are still no net, um, so there's still zero carbon. Um, a lot of times we also see um, blue um, or green, I mean, sorry, blue or uh, um, gray hydrogen, which is um, hydrogen, where we're using grid power or some other power that does produce carbon. So um, certainly the goal is, is to, in the most cases, use green hydrogen. Next slide. So this project was specifically for San Diego Gas and Electric. Um, I've extracted a few bullets from their sustainability pledge that they have 
um, up on their website. So they're basically looking to um, make all of their um, energy production to, to reach the net zero goal by 2045 um, and that they're trying to eliminate um, emissions associated with its operations. Um, as well as those generated by its customers' consumption of energy. The Palomar Hydrogen Project is um, one of their um, key projects that they're proposing in order to meet these goals. Next. The, um, uh, the project is at the Palomar Energy Center, which as I mentioned, is a 288 megawatt combined cycle power plant. Um, it was, uh, it's going to be producing hydrogen on site using an electrolyzer system. It's also going to um, have a hydrogen fueling station and it's going to use some solar panels to help produce part of the power. Um, but at least at this point, it's only looking at a 2% hydrogen blend. So that's a pretty small percentage as a pilot. And what they're gonna do is you know, once they see how that goes, um, then they'll try to increase the percentage of hydrogen at a later date. Next. So this is just an aerial view of the Palomar hydrogen plant as it stands today. Um, next slide. This is a, a project flow diagram. It's kind of basic. You can see that they're going to um, use the solar to help produce the hydrogen and electrolyzer, they're gonna use um, demineralized water. And it's, um, I think a good point to raise that the Palomar Energy Center uses 100% recycled water from um, a nearby wastewater treatment plant. So there's no um, use of, of uh, clean water. And they're gonna store the hydrogen on site in cylinders. Some of it's gonna to go to the fueling station um, they already use hydrogen on uh, site for power plant cooling, and then they're gonna have 2% uh, of the hydrogen for the fuel blend. Next. Um, these are just some of the specifications of the particular um, electrolyzer that they're proposing to use at Palomar. It's a um, HEM um, type, which is called a couple of different things. and um, will produce hydrogen with 99.9995% um, purity. Next. So one, um, one might question, you know, why did we have to do some air permitting for a project that's proposing to use uh, such a slow amount of, uh, such a small amount of hydrogen in a power plant? And um, it's, you know, it's not a regulated pollutant and the electrolyzer that produces it just uses electricity and water. Um, and we know that the power generation can, equipment can easily use up to 10% blended with no changes to the gas turbine equipment. And the hydrogen fueling station doesn't require a permit. And um, the hydrogen storage currently proposed is below the CalARP um, threshold of 10,000 pounds on site. So, you know, why did we need to do um, permitting? And the next slide is the, uh, the agencies that we had to work with to do the permitting. And I, I see that we do have somebody from the California Energy Commission online today. So hello, Jerry. Um, but we worked with them to do a, a post-certification amendment. Um, all power plants, all thermal power plants in California that produce over 50 megawatts do have to um, get a, a, um, a license from the California Energy Commission. And so we did need to make changes to that to make sure um, that we uh, um, could, could put these new project components on site. And we did get that um, approval in May 22 and 2, so just a few months ago. Um, we also worked with the San Diego APCD. Um, we had to uh, make a modification to a couple of permit conditions um, to uh, to make this allowance work. Um, and we did get that permit issued. Um, it was issued, I think, in June of 2022, or maybe it was May, I don't remember. Um, but the other uh, agency that we were kind of surprised about that we hadn't thought of before, but did come up is actually EPA um, 
had to has to make an approval and that's under um, the acid rain program under the part 75 uh, regulations it it uh, it has approved use of fuels um, that you can use um, and hydrogen isn't on their on their list so there was a petition that needed to be submitted and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment so we we did meet with these um, all these agencies last year to kind of line out our process and then uh, went forward with getting our permits and approvals so next slide So the reason we had to get a permit a modification from the uh, San Diego APCD turned out to be a fairly simple matter that it had a permit condition that said we could only use um, California Public Utilities Commission natural gas. So we obviously had to revise that permit condition to say um, that it would also allow for the blending of the hydrogen. Um, there are several permit conditions in the uh, facility permit that dealt with the SAMs and referenced CFR Part 75, but as long as we complied with those and submit this petition and get that approved, um, those permit conditions did not require changing. Um, San Diego ABCD did opt to um, change uh, one of the permit conditions that dealt with record keeping to uh, specifically identify that um, we had to monitor the hydrogen. So pretty, pretty simple from an air permitting standpoint. Um, but then we also had, um, as I mentioned, this EPA procedures. And, and basically, I've given the quotation of the sections in there that um, there's a requirement in section 3.3.6 um, where you have to look at the F factor calculations, both related to, sorry, um, both related to uh, um, the greenhouse gas calculation and also um, related to, uh, to NOx calculations. So um, we did do a, a draft petition to EPA and we have submitted that um, and uh, they're processing it, but you can't actually submit the final petition until the project is built and you have the actual hydrogen from the facility. I think that's uh, detailed a little bit more in the next slide as well. So that, that process is still ongoing. Um, EPA has told only ones that have submitted such a petition, even though we know that several hydrogen projects are, are going. And um, uh, we're just now waiting for the, the project. They started um, installing some of the solar panels and um, are moving forward with trying to get the electrolyzer and the and the um, various components installed. But until we have actual hydrogen at the facility, we won't be able to finish this um, petition. Uh, next slide. So in, in conclusion, um, you know, we from what we're seeing is is we fully expect more gas turbine facilities to be proposing hydrogen use as a way to make uh, California greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, we don't, we haven't seen um, a lot of information available. I asked this question up at the annual conference uh, um, at a panel that was held about hydrogen and um, EPRI has some data and there are a few facilities that have emissions data, but uh, we're also looking for this uh, testing program that York is assisting another client with um, it's going to help us get uh, more actual emissions data on the effects of hydrogen at higher levels than um, we're proposing here, the 10%, and that uh, we think that these um, early pilot projects are going to help pave the way for future permitting. So with that, um, I think uh, I have maybe one or two minutes for um, questions. I don't see any new questions in the chat box, but um, Simon, do you, do you see anything new? No, uh, first of all, thank you, Sarah, for the very uh, informative presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat and I don't see any hands raised. Um, um, maybe in the interest of time, we can uh, move forward to Michael's presentation. Okay. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Michael Slavik. 
Um, Michael is a senior project manager for the Air Quality Compliance Group at NSAFE, Inc. He has extensive experience in working with many clients to achieve um, compliance with state, local, and federal requirements. Um, for over 30 years, he's conducted numerous emissions calculations, dispersion modeling analyses, and health risk assessments to support air permit applications on CEQA. Um, he's currently serving as the treasurer of the San Diego chapter, and today he's going to talk about wildfire risk influence, influence the changes to utility infrastructures and land use developments. Michael? Thank you, Sarah. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the presentation that I presented up in San Francisco last month was part of the uh, the climate change uh, wildfire risks discussion. And so it was one of the three papers that was uh, presented as part of the uh, session. I'm going to talk about my project experience uh, dealing with uh, like air quality permitting as well as uh, dealing with uh, the environmental study through the CEQA documents, which is the California Environmental Quality Act environmental planning document. So uh, I decided to focus on my presentation on how the wildfires could influence the change to the utility infrastructure as well as the land use development. All right, next slide. Uh, okay. Uh, basically, this is my introduction here. I'll be uh, discussing about the effect of climate change. So we know that uh, the climate impacts are here. And in the past year, uh, there's been several uh, wireland fires trend that's been growing um, throughout the Western United States. So I'd like to share and talk to you about my project experience in working with uh, the housing development projects and the backup power generation facilities and how these wildfires um, impacted those two projects based on my experience that I'm seeing um, out there. Uh, the wildfire risk stuff that flows the existing and the future um, electrical energy infrastructure system uh, all across the Western United States, especially in California and Utah, um, up in Oregon, you know, um, because they have long transmission lines that's going across the state, and those transmission lines could generate uh, sparks from the wildfire that's causing them to uh, spread uh, sparks on the dry vegetation. And that's what's caused the, uh, the wireland fires throughout the area. And those wireland fires can also impact the uh, land use developments where uh, there's housing developments that could potentially uh, encroach upon uh, the wind wirelands areas. So um, here's the picture on the next slide um, showing that this was happening about two or three years ago when uh, there are several wildfires up in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and it turned the sky bright orange area. And so you can see this from this looking at this picture that, uh, you know, it's turned bright orange, and the climate is almost looked like you're on the planet of Mars. So uh, this was kind of a unique picture that I wanted to share with you guys. Anyway, next slide. Uh, the projected impact of climate change in the Western United States are pretty significant. Uh, the climate change is impacting fires behavior. Uh, the drivers in numerous ways, there's higher temperature, there's uh, more erratic, uh, low precipitation uh, that results in drier soil and reduced the snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas. And it's creating more frequent um, droughts in the condition that are prone to major fires. There have been many uh, researchers that have been uh, looking at different conclusions about the effect of climate change. 
on the win, uh, which we're looking at extreme wind events such as like the Santa Ana and the Diabillo uh, wind effect that has created the most devastating wildfires in California. Next slide. Uh, this slide here, um, you know, like when you do your environmental study, you look at the uh, meteorological data to uh, capture your data for your modeling analysis. Well, we're doing the same thing for an environmental study for um, looking at the wind, wildfires, potential impacts on, you know, the project site. And so uh, we use this uh, information from the National Significant Wind Limb Fires Potential Outlook Projection. And so uh, the next four slide looks at the projection of each month during the summer, like June, July, August, September. So as you recall, only a part of this year, there were some wildfires that started out in uh, like New Mexico, Arizona area, and is it and then uh, by July, it kind of spread out uh, other states like in Colorado, up in Northern California, Oregon, and everything. But by the time you reach to August, um, you can see that the projection moves down toward like um, Central California, the Sierra Nevada, where we now have um, oak fires that's happening near Yosemite right now. So uh, you can see that's the pretty good projection that um, wildfires are happening. Um, other places that you're seeing, it's up in Montana, how it starts to expand. So we're hearing that there's wildfires out in Montana um, area. And uh, so these are, um, the climate is showing that it's getting drier and drier um, as we approach to the end of the summer, only fall periods. And so on. you can see that the uh, the weather patterns can also affect how dry the area becomes and expose dry vegetation to potential wildfires risk. Uh, the next line um, shows the uh, this September that we have um, a projection on the wildfire trends, which is on the next slide. As we know, the uh, yes, right here, uh, the wildfire trends. We use that, uh, we take the historical data from the past most destructive fires. Um, and then we also look at the financial impact that's caused by these wildfires. So uh, the number of wildfires, uh, the acreage burn, the structure burns have increased. So you can see that uh, the trend is increasing as well as the financial loss that's also increased associated with the cost of fighting fires. Next slide. Um, this, uh, with this amount of data that we have in place, um, I just wanted to share with you that based on my type of project that I'm working with, um, the healthy development and as well as the backup power generation, uh, the next slide, uh, which shows that every state has some amount of wildfire risk because every state has the wild, we call it a wet, wetland urban interface. Wowie, that's the acronym, it switches the area where the development intermix with the natural areas of abundance, vegetation, wildfires, uh, back of fuel, um, potential uh, land use development in the area. So because of this uh, issue of placing more people in any um, utility infrastructure in harm's way. And so we start seeing uh, healthy development that are kind of like uh, encroaching onto the wetlands, I mean, not the wetlands, the wildlands areas. And uh, this, is placing more people in a serious uh, jeopardy to uh, cause their lives to be in danger. Next slide. 
Um, you can look at the um, escalated, it's not off the point I was trying to make it that uh, escalated the healthy development on a quality to when violence areas. Uh, it could escalate the damage that um, caused by uh, wildfire. So uh, it could cause the electrical out due to the area. Uh, the power outage can lead to interruption to the business, home, education, work life. Um, it causes uh, construction delays because there's cleanup. They have to redesign and do the whole uh, healthy permitting process. And the local governments are struggling with wildfires, preventive measures, uh, trying to come up with suppression programs and um, adaptation plans. And so all of this costs the increased costs for building uh, homes and business in the area. Uh, other building materials that they have to consider is like the advanced technology with the air filtration system and also finding ways to come up with backup power systems. Next slide, please. Uh, for these uh, housing projects, uh, because part of the wildfire risk that we have to look at with two vents that may involve in like amber resistant ventilation or vents in the roofs, fire resistant roofs. Um, Creating irrigated uh, defensible space. So you have to, I'm sure you've been hearing that, that clear the areas around your home if you're next to uh, heavy vegetation uh, in the, the mountains or in the hillside or in the canyons. Um, there's uh, also other uh, materials that's being considered is the sprinkling system for. Uh, internally in the building as well as outside in the building area. Uh, rooftop solar and clean energy microgrids are also part of the uh, features that's being included as part of the land use planning and fire conservation. Uh, in San Diego County, this is just an example of one of the projects that I'm working on. San Diego County has similar uh, healthy development that has uh, spread out into the suburban area and into uh, the semi-urban areas, which uh, is more rural and is highly prone to uh, fire-prone areas of the county. So um, the county, when they, you know, approved projects that are um, designated for development of new healthy development stuff. Um, people have challenged uh, those healthy development because they are concerned about uh, the lack of infrastructure that's available to uh, for emergency service in case of those homes are um, impacted by the wildfire. So, uh, there's been several uh, issues involving that's causing the uh, lack of building uh, fire codes requirement. Um, so they have to upgrade those healthy fire codes. Um, insurance, affordability of insurance. Uh, there's been a lot of cancellation of, from insurance company because they feel like they can't um, finance the uh, potential risk to pay off the insurance of your home. Yeah. Uh, there's also the lack of funding for uh, area of the infrastructure that are in location with high fires, hazard zones. Uh, next slide. So because of this sequence environmental planning, um, it required us to start evaluating wildfires impacts part of the project. So uh, the sequent guidelines now requires to look at the four questions that comes up as part of the uh, evaluation process. We have to look at the emergency response or an emergency evacuation plan. Uh, what are the pollution concentration that could be impacted from wildfires? Uh, that's usually mostly the particulates. Uh, and also hot gas 
conditions. Third question would be, uh, we have to look at what are the potential infrastructure that may excavate the fire risk. And also we have to look at whether these wildfires could expose people or the structure to a significant risk. And uh, we are required to find a, a finding of a significant impact of those wildfires. So, so those are the new risks that are now involved um, sequence of fire model planning. Uh, the new California state law has uh, been passed to uh, require that any home owners that are planning to sell their homes in uh, you know, resident, I mean, the high prone fire areas. So they have to disclose that information because uh, there's maps that are classified uh, different wildfires, hazards zone. They start with moderate, high, very high. And so that's part of the plan that we have to disclose. So at any point of sale, um, there's certain compliance requirement that uh, before they could sell the, the homes, basically they have to be able to show a defensible space and um, vegetation management program. Next slide. Um, this brings me, uh, that concludes my land use development project. I'm going to move over to my other project experience that I have with uh, electric power transmission. Power transmission line infrastructure currently spans four states. You know, we have a uh, transmission line over California, Nevada, Oregon, and Utah. Uh, they consist of high voltage transmission line that carries electricity from power generation facility to the area and low voltage power lines that deliver powers to residents and businesses in your community. There's because of the growing population that are now living in uh, wildland urban interface area, Wowie areas, means that more community are exposed to wildfires risk and more electrical infrastructure is being built and those that utility will require uh, to provide service in the high wildfire prone areas. Next slide. Sorry, Mike, I just want to mention that uh, if you could wrap it up in five minutes, that would be great. Yeah. Sure. Um, let's move on to uh, the slide on page 21. I don't the see the uh, Is this the right slide? sustainability goals? You can transfer from uh, fossil fuels to electrification. Uh, we can, uh, because the, the California Air Resource Board has new regulation for um, allow the use of backup generators for uh, public safety power shutoff system. And so, because of that, the PS, PS system, uh, many household and business are planning to operate. Uh, backup power generators because of the concerns of uh, the major utility companies may shut down their power lines. And uh, if generators that are using to uh, power outage would increase the emission. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the backup power generators, uh, many high tech business are installing multiple backup generators. Uh, like for example, the, the computer data centers are looking into installing more backup generators. Uh, we have several businesses that are looking to um, multiple like internal combustion engine generators. And so they're, they're installing like the equipment packs. Um, also we have the battery packs that are being installed by property management company, like for example, the, the Irvine company has installed uh, the Tesla batteries packs. And you can see that picture that they're installing as part of the office building infrastructure, because they don't want to lose their tenants um, because of their power outage issue in the area. So this brings my conclusion uh, that wildfires are a topic of discussion on almost every project. Uh, wildfires will continue to be escalated due to the impact of climate change 
you know, longer fire season. Uh, local government builders, utility companies are responding uh, to these uh, potential wire fire hazards, and they're including them part of their planning and uh, updating their building utility codes along with uh, wire fire suppression and response. So that concludes my uh, speech. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or anyone at uh, Air Waste Management Association. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so I would like to ask Bernadette if she yep. could uh, do the closing. Thank you. So I want to do a, re a real quick recap on our annual conference. It was held in San Francisco the end of June. And it went well, and everybody really was pleased. I think people were just happy to get together again. Uh, the registration was about 600 people. It's less than in 2019, but considering people losing luggage, air flights being canceled, people getting COVID, overall, I think it was pretty good attendance. Um, our West Coast uh, leaders, Sarah Head and Rob Farber, received two out of six awards at the Honor and Awards Ceremony. Uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo student chapter team, Amali Foster, Julia Lewin, Rami Wapa won the environmental challenge competition, and our students won other scholarship and paper poster competitions as well. One of our West Coast directors, Ji Chen Chang, was a co-author and one of the four YP paper award winners. And the program consisted of a keynote session, critical review, exhibition, a uh, mini symposium with eight featured sessions, 146 presentations, 33 platform sessions, 26 panels, and one poster session, and eight concurrent sessions. So there was a lot of great content. So if you missed, the final program is available on the AWA website, and you can purchase the proceedings um, soon. Uh, and the three people that we had present today were just three from um, the West Coast section. I understand there were other people as well that presented, including all of our YPs and our students. So just wanted to give everybody a quick uh, summary of what went on with ACE. Encourage you, if you are not a member, please become a member of West Coast section. Also, um, the San Diego chapter is getting revitalized. Michael's involved. Um, James Westbrook, our vice chair, is involved. And if you are in San Diego or know somebody in San Diego, encourage them to get involved with that chapter. Thanks for joining everyone. Thank you, Bernadette. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.